Fish in a Tree by Linda Mulally Hunt. Chapter 5. Silver Dollars and Wooden Nickels. The back door swings open and my brother Travis is there, smelling like grease, looking like he rolled in it, and I instantly feel better. How's my favorite little sister? I'm your only little sister. Doesn't matter, you'd still be my favorite, he smiles. So your favorite big brother had a silver dollar day today. I think of Grandpa and Dad, who always asked us if we were having a silver dollar day or a wooden nickel one. Travis is doing that thing where he wiggles his fingers in the air and asks his daily question. What are these? He looks older, more like my dad, who's been deployed since just before Thanksgiving last year. It was hard to feel thankful after he'd gone, especially since Grandpa had died three months before that. The hands of a genius, I say. Correctamundo, do you realize you come home every day and ask me to compliment you? Not really, he says, opening the fridge, just asking you to state the facts. You are unbelievable. Exactly, he says, pointing at me. Guess what? I finished restoring an old Coke machine today. Thing is like 70 years old. He pops open a soda. Those things are worth a bundle fixed up. Then he holds up the can. Look at this, disappointing compared to those old green bottles. Travis must be happy. The happier he is, the more he goes on about things. And, he says, I picked up an old gumball machine, the kind that takes pennies. I'll sell it for ten times what I paid for it. His voice drops as he takes a sip. I will have to throw some money and elbow grease at it first, though. He comes over like he's going to mess up my hair, but I block his dirty hands. No way, I laugh. Don't touch me. Aw, come on, Al. I've had a great day. And guess what? I almost have enough to buy those rolling tool cabinets. And someday, my big neon sign. He sweeps his hand through the air like he's showing me a row of mountains. Nickerson Restoration. My own place. My name, our name, is going to be in light someday, Al. But then his voice deflates. I just have to get out of high school. We're like oil and water school and me. I wish mom would let me quit. She would kill you. Yeah, so would dad. And being dead won't be good for my business, he smiles. Won't be long though. I'm learning a ton at the garage. The boss is letting me do all kinds of different stuff. I smile. I'm gonna buy a car soon too, a classic and a V6 at least. And then he's off and I can still smell the grease after he's gone. I'm glad he had a silver dollar day. When my mom finally gets home, I've already microwaved my dinner and I'm watching TV while I sketch pictures of my pet llama named Butch Cassidy. With a name like that, I give him a cowboy hat, a bandana, and a holster. But in the holster, he carries an ear of corn. When my mom comes home in from work, she turns off the TV and I can feel it coming. So, she begins, when are we going to really talk about today? On my 95th birthday? Funny one, she shifts her weight. I'm trying to be patient, honey. I really am. But today was a party. How could you get into trouble at a party? I don't have to do anything. They all hate me, I blurt out. I doubt that. But can't you see why they'd be tired of your behavior? These shocking things you do and say to get laughs? She doesn't get it. Being funny when you don't mean to be is terrible. Having to laugh at yourself along with everyone else is humiliating. Oh, Allie, you're too smart for this. School is too important to joke about. I don't want you working long hours on your feet for a bunch of tips like me. I want more for you. And you're so smart, good at math, a gifted artist. Don't you think it's time to start stop clowning around? I'm not that smart. You say that, but I'm not. Now, we know that isn't true. You could stand to work a little harder, though. I'm so tired of this conversation. We've had it a hundred times, even though my third grade teacher told her that I might just be slow, that my mom shouldn't expect too much from me. My mom's eyes got all wide and shiny when she heard that, and I felt sad and embarrassed for her having to be my mom. But my mother's never bought what that teacher said. I sometimes wish she would, but most times I'm grateful that she hasn't. She bends over to look me dead in the eyes. I know that moving as much as we have had has been hard on you. And I know I work all the time and can't keep tabs on your schoolwork. It has made it hard for you to keep up with some subjects, and I understand that. I really do. But you're going to have to make more effort, Allie. 
Things worth having are worth working for. I'll do better, I tell her. I used to say this and mean it. Now it feels like I'm just making up one of my stories. Her smile is sad. Okay, then. She kisses the top of my head. Can I turn the TV back on now? She unties her apron and stares. Did you take your bath yet? No, I sigh. The tiredness in her voice says there's no use arguing. I trudge toward the hallway. By the way, I don't want to hear you say that people hate you, she calls out. How could anyone on earth possibly hate you? I wish she could understand my world, but it would be like trying to explain to a whale what it's like to live in the forest. Chapter 6. Triple-sided coin. Travis opens the door of the pawn shop in town and waves me in ahead of him. The bell on the door announces our arrival as it hits the glass. The dusty smell of the place triggers a bunch of memories. Good times. Together times. When Dad and Grandpa would take Travis and me out looking for coins. Numbers and money are something Travis and I can do well, so we took to it fast. Grandpa loved the dusty stores best because they were the ones that would have uncracked rolls of coins in the backs of their safes. When the store owners would trade the old rolls for new bills, we'd open them at home to see what was inside. Sometimes we'd find a buffalo nickel, a mercury dime, or an Indian head penny. It was like a little bit of Christmas. Being here makes me ache to go back in time. The man behind the counter doesn't say hello. He rolls a toothpick back and forth in his mouth with his tongue. In one way, it's a completely impressive, and in another, the grossest thing I've ever seen. Travis rests his fingertips on the glass counter, looking down into the case filled with coins. You need something? The man doesn't talk that way to, that way to mom, says you're supposed to talk to customers. I want to buy some coins, Travis says. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Travis brushes his chin with his knuckle, something he does when he is nervous. The guy reaches up and takes the toothpick out of his mouth. He uses it to point at Travis. Do you have money or are you all talk? Travis does what dad said never to do. He shows him his money and not money like a regular person, a roll of money wrapped in an elastic band. The guy's eyes widen. Then he asks, looking for something special? I want Liberty coins. You got any? He takes out several coins. One is a mercury dime with a head that looks like it has wings for ears. I remember those, I say, like the one daddy has in his wallet. Travis turns them over in his hand. Nice. You have anything more unusual? The guy's eyebrows jump. He reaches into a drawer. This is unusual, but it'll cost you big. I don't mind paying for something special. Okay, then, he says. This one is special. He puts a penny on the counter. Travis picks it up and his eyebrows bunch up. This is smaller than the other pennies. The guy nods. It is. A rare find. Travis glances at me and then he turns towards the guy. How much? Well, the guy says, if you know anything about coins, you know that a coin with a flaw in it is far more valuable than a regular coin. Something isn't right with it and it's worth more? Like I said, Travis says, how much? The guy tilts his head to the side. Well, normally I'd ask for 80, but I'll charge you, say, 75. Travis smiles. Even I remember how Dad used to tell us never to smile when you get a number. Never. Even if it's the best number in the world. And here he is smiling like he won the lottery. I try to look serious enough for the both of us. Well, that's really generous of you. 75 bucks for a penny that's been dipped in nit nitric acid. The guy's smile falls off his face. I bet the police would be interested in a little bit of fraud. Now listen. Travis interrupts. Look, I wasn't born yesterday. Stop messing with me. Travis points at a coin in the case that has a walking woman wrapped in a sheet that was the sun rays behind her. It is beautiful. That 1933 walking liberty half dollar. How much for that one? Well, that one is in really fine condition. In fact, just tell me how much, Travis says, leaning in, palms on the glass. 45. 36 and you throw in the mercury dime for my little sister. I look up quick. For me? Then I do the math. Yep, he is following Dad's rule of offering 20% less than what they offer. But Travis threw in something extra. The guy squints. 40. Travis nods. Done. He slaps the money on the glass, count, glass case. Outside the store, Travis holds the dime toward me. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it so much. Thank you, Travis. You're the best. He looks a little sad staring at the coin. 
You know, Grandpa was born in 1933. That's why I chose these coins. They were both minted in that year. I looked down at my mercury dime and it's dated, wishing people could last as long as coins. When we get into the car, Travis says, did you see how that guy in there took me for a fool, trying to rip me off? Remember, Allie, when people have low expectations of you, you can sometimes use it to your advantage. Then he looks me right in the eyes and points at my nose. As long as you don't have low expectations of yourself, you hear? I nod again, but I think to myself that it's hard not to these days.